it's, it's one of those foundational things that we really want our students to understand is that making mistakes and falling down and failing is part of the process of success, um, not its antithesis. And I think that's, you talk about playing it safe to a certain degree. We want to give students an opportunity to really take risks and not, not play it safe within the bounds, hopefully, of, um, of an environment that it's, you know, it's conducive to do so. Yeah, I mean, you know, unless you're writing maybe a, a, a memo, like a business email, I, I say this all the time in class, safe writing is never great writing. And when, when you feel like you're under the gun all the time, um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get good. And it's something that I, I, I actually didn't do it this past year, but I normally do independent like writing journals where it's a list of random prompts and then kids can pick some of their own. And at the end of the quarter, you got to turn in what you wrote. And I flip through, I skim through, I usually just read one or two of them at random. And I think it's important to develop your voice because in that setting, it's okay to write something that ended up bad. You know, when you think everything you do gets a grade and when you believe that every grade leads to a transcript, which gets you into or keeps you out of a college, which gets you or doesn't get you a job. When a student feels like they're constantly under the, under that pressure, we don't take a lot of risks and, and we end up just not doing good work. Like failure is an essential part of learning and whether it's in your career, or it's in school. And I think that I don't know if it's as a society as a whole, but certainly within school, we've gotten to a point where somehow failure is a bad thing and that, that it's something that's punished. And so I see a lot of very smart kids who play it very, very safe through a lot of their education. And as a result, I don't think they're learning as much as they could. They're not growing as much as they can. Um, with working one-on-one -on -one, and obviously you're not, you know, grading the students. I think you're probably making as big or bigger an impact on young people's writing skills as they were getting in their English classes, because now they can, they can do it without this fear of, you know, what does this do to my GPA? What does this do to the rest of it? Um, in your experience in your job now, like how much writing instruction, quote unquote, I'm not that you're doing a grammar lesson per se, but how much like writing instruction is involved in what you're doing versus just sort of guiding students through the process. Like are, are you're, you're in that writing process with them. Yeah. So we work quite closely with our students on developing their writing skills. I think that's one of the most crucial things that we do amongst others. You know, we start thinking about creative writing um, when students come to us, when they're freshmen and sophomores and, you know, they're developing their skills and practicing. So when it comes time to write those college essays junior year, they're, they're ready to hit the ground running um, because they, they've been practicing the kind of self-reflection and writing style that a college essay uh, or a good college essay requires. So, yeah, we, we do a lot of that. Yeah, and, and we don't unfortunately do a lot of that in high school, I think, you know, there's not a lot of narrative uh, work, like once, especially for your kids who are in AP classes, you know, you're doing everything sort of focused on this test and focused on analytical skills. And that's a, that's a tough transition to make sometimes. So you're working with kids sort of throughout. So, so we're sort of, you're sort of building the critical thinking and the self-awareness that goes with it. What I just said a moment ago about students worried about their GPA, you know, not taking risks in their schoolwork from your perspective, how is that affecting students' actual education? Negatively, <laughs> to, be, to be quite honest. This, we have an interesting experience going on right now. You're, you're just finishing the school year, um, so you're well aware of it. But has your school gone test or um, pass-fail? Yeah, so for the fourth quarter, it was p or n they don't call it failing it's pass yeah. or not pass and yeah but, but it couldn't negatively affect a student's gpa so a student could essentially do zero for the fourth quarter and their grade would be determined based on previous work for the year so that there was nothing you know binding in that fourth quarter if they did well they could help their gpa but they couldn't hurt it so it was pass fail with some weird caveats in there you know a lot of students have asked and parents have asked us is this going how is this going to affect my college application you know, is this going to be, be negative? And I just completely flip that on its head and say, this is one of the greatest opportunities you've ever had to not be so focused on, on the grade, um, but really be more exploratory in what you're studying 
and what you can, you know, what you can take it to. So being, you know, being able to explore something deeper and going off on a tangent that might cause you to be less prepared for the test. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a legitimate question to ask whether or not we should bring those grades back. Yeah, no, I, I did, uh, almost all these podcasts, I talk with someone else, you know, like this, but I, I've done a few solo ones and a few weeks after school's closed, it was probably early April, something like that. Um, I did one, it might've been later than that, but I did one and, and one of the segments was about grading. And I firmly believe that if we're serious about improving the quality of education, not data collection or anything else, but um, we should just, everything should be pass fail or you could do like advanced pass and fail where if you truly are one of the top three kids and you're, we can mark you as advanced. That's great. But otherwise I don't know why we spend so much time arguing on the difference between an 88 and a 91, because in most settings there is zero difference, whether or not you ate breakfast or what time you went to bed the night before can dictate the difference between an 88 and a 91. So the idea that somehow that difference turns into a grade that affects the GPA that affects, or that we think is going to affect all these other things, I think is insane. Yeah. I, I personally, would love it because as you pointed out, it would take the pressure off. You know, if you don't love chemistry, it doesn't mean you shouldn't learn a little bit of it, but maybe you could just say, well, I learned the basics. I got a 70 and whatever I, I passed the class. I move on and more dedicate yourself more completely to the things you care about. Um, I think that would be one of the easiest things to do because it would also allow for more intrinsic motivation. I think right now too much of what students are experiencing is extrinsic. They're worried about college admissions. They're worried about, you know, their, their reputation with their peers or the teachers. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think that the shift online has gone particularly well in most places. Uh, people are generally averse to change and this was change that came very quickly without a plan. So, you know, an emergency response is not the way to judge, you know, how that change would look long-term. But I, I think it sounds like we're probably in agreement. I would love if we could go to some sort of pass fail uh, or, you know, less precise quote unquote grading grading methods because I think it takes our eye off the ball. We stop thinking about learning and we start thinking about, does it look like you learned? And I, I don't think that that's good for people in the long, in the long run. Get rid of that AP test. Um, I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a weird place because I used to hate standardized tests and believe more strongly in grades in the classes. And what I've seen, I just finished my 14th year teaching and what I've seen and I think it's nationwide, but I, it, it's, it's heavy where I work. Uh, it just in this whole region really is there's a lot of grade inflation. You know, when, when the most common grade given in a high school is an A minus or a B plus there's, you cannot say you're grading honestly, like not everyone is that good at everything. And so by inflating the grades, it means it's really, the grades aren't actually telling you how much the kid learned or how good or bad they're in a subject. So I, and, and I used to hate the tests and I'm actually now in a place where I would prefer if we could do something sort of like a pass fail and then keep some of the standardized tests at the end so that you have something more measurable. I, I think the tests are, are flawed. I think say SATs and ACTs are imperfect. So I, I'm not saying those would have to be the tests, but if I was put in charge, I would do pass fail grading through your classes and then keep those tests at the end as a measurement so that you had something quantitative that you could compare students with since the pass fail doesn't give you a lot to work with. Um, and that is a complete reversal from where I was for the first five or eight years of my, my teaching. But I mean, what do you think? It, yeah, it's interesting. I always thought separating the coach and gatekeeper function was important in, um, and, and one of the struggles of, of teaching in the classroom. So, you know, when I was in graduate school, one of the things we experimented with was as as the instructor we coached the students on improving their writing and then when they had their final papers other instructors would actually give them their marks and you know that allowed for a lot of freedom and a different relationship because as a coach we weren't actually the evaluator i think that was a really interesting um, experiment and model that i thought worked pretty well do you, do you actually, do you think that, do you think it worked well? Because what you just said, I'm actually really excited about this. So if I ramble in just a second, I'm going to apologize in advance. Yeah. I just suggested something like that recently in my school. For you, do you feel like it benefited the students or the professors or both or not? I mean, like, do you think that that is a model that could work? I think it benefited 
everyone in, involved for sure. As the teacher, being able to really just be on the student's side and helping them develop as much as possible and being able to individualize and, you know, getting, taking each student from where they are to, to where they can get to in, during, you know, during that class time, um, I thought was, was really a great opportunity as a teacher. And I think it benefits the students tremendously in terms of, you know, having somebody that they, you know, they can go to that's not, not that, not in that gatekeeper function. They can ask, they can ask questions. They can really focus on, on getting better and, you know, know that that's not the person that's going to ultimately be deciding how well they, you know, what mark they get in that class. So I think, I think it's quite a good idea. I think it takes time and effort. The teachers have to work together and all be committed. And we had a lot of meetings and time where we calibrated, which I think is a good, good thing as well, to make sure that we're all looking at the similar things. You know, I have students all the time that come and say, well, my, it's unfair. My teacher is so much tougher of a grader than uh, my friend's teacher who takes it uh, next period. And, you know, that, that does happen. But again, to bring it, sort of bring it back, this is just not the thing that students should be worried about. Um, it's not the thing that makes a difference in college admissions. There's in a holistic admissions application review, there are so many things that go into it that make, as you were saying, the difference between having a, a 3.9 and a 3.7, you know, negligible. Yeah, like it doesn't even matter. And and I'm going to try not to ramble, but the thing the thing that I yeah. had suggested. Sorry, I'm, I'm doing no, that. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's a perfect explanation. That's actually really helpful to me because what I had suggested, we're having all these talks about how do we get, you know, more reliable data about what we're doing in the classroom. And we always want to use the grades. And then we get into talks about using the standardized rubric and all these things. And that that's fine. I said, you know, for me personally, and I don't know if most teachers would like this or not, but I would gladly take a class of 60 kids if I didn't have to grade all the essays. So my suggestion was hire one person that is the department grader, you know, pick someone who's young or old or who's just good at reading, but hates working with the kids or whatever it is, you know, and that person can just do all the grading. And that way you have one person, they don't know the kids, so they can't have a bias for or against someone. Um, my job is to get the kid as prepared as I can to help them as much as I can. And in the end, you now have data where, there is no difference between teacher A and teacher B because all the grading was done by one person on one rubric or one set of rubrics, you know, whatever it is. It takes the personal bias out of it. It means that an individual, say, English teacher, history teacher, could actually have more students in the room because less of the time gets tied up in the feedback and assessment piece. You can actually say, as you point out, sit down and have one-on-one -on -one conferences and work with the students. Like, I, I think something like that would be fantastic. And it could in the end essentially be budget neutral because you just sort of move where you're paying for the man hours. So I think stuff like that would be great. Now, in terms of how you just said that the difference, you know, is negligible for admissions.